guns and money. I'd like to welcome everyone. This is kind of a hybrid panel slash episode of Conduct Detrimental, so it is being recorded. For your guys' purposes, if you guys have any questions, we obviously put together a rough agenda, but to the extent that you guys have questions, feel free to drop them in the chat or send them straight to Taryn and he'll uh, throw it, throw them to us accordingly. So I'm Dan. I'm also next to virtually next to Dan. Am I, am I touching Dan if I put my hand this way? Maybe. We run a podcast called Conduct Detrimental. You know, Taryn works with us behind the scenes as one of our, we'll say, research, expert researchers. How about that? Social, social media expert. We cover everything sports and law. That could be uh, something like uh, the Rocks XFL bankruptcy case to something uh, that people maybe are more familiar with, the Zion Williamson trilogy. Oh, well, not trilogy. We'll say two, two-part lawsuit. With that being said, I want to uh, kind of introduce my co-host, Dan Wallach. Dan, why don't you uh, kind of uh, give people your quick background and then we can get into the fun stuff. Buddy, thanks for uh, joining us today on the podcast. I and started Conduct at two, three years, no, three, three years ago with Dan Worley, the two Dan, so we continue with the trend of the Dan's. But when Dan left to become general counsel, I started to go it alone for a few weeks and I realized I needed a partner because the conversation around sports law works a lot better when you have a partner rather than just talking into, into space. So I asked Dan to join and be my partner a couple of months ago, and it's worked out really nicely. Uh, thankfully, this field gives us a lot of fresh new content every week, so we don't really have to write the episodes. They kind of write themselves. Okay, so Taryn, let me, let me kick it over to you. Why don't you give us just a quick roadmap of the topics that you have planned for today? And then, uh, you know, toss us the first one and then we'll, we'll get going. My name is Taryn Sharma. I'm the vice president of the Sports Law Association at the University of Minnesota. I think we should start with a topic that's near and dear to me. It's how I found you guys on Twitter and, and eventually the Conduct Detrimental podcast. So this week there was a pretty big bombshell in the Zion Williamson case with the, uh, the judge announcing or disclosing that his son could have financial implications if the case was ruled a certain way. I was hoping that maybe you guys could catch us up on how this case has started, the, the two different cases in North Carolina and Florida, and, and where we are right now. That's a loaded question to encapsulate a year and a half of parallel litigation in two different states, one federal court, one state court in different states. Not an easy task, but it all stemmed from the announcement uh, of by Zion Williamson to declare for the NBA draft in May of 2017. It turned out, well, actually, May 2018, it turned out that he had signed a marketing agreement with a relatively unknown agent by the name of Gina Ford. And her agreement entitled her to basically 15% of his off-the-court earnings in what I would call a non-cancelable contract. It didn't have a specific duration. It can only be terminated, if at all, for cause, and then, and then only after the fifth year. So he gave her exclusive marketing rights to him, and uh, he's, he decided this wasn't a very good deal. And he signed with Creative Artists Agency. Uh, and terminated his relationship with Gina. That led to dueling lawsuits where Zion sued Gina Ford in North Carolina federal court on the theory that when she entered into the marketing agreement with him, she hadn't registered as an agent with the North Carolina Attorney General's office. North Carolina has a, a, a uh, I wouldn't say a unique law because a lot of states, a number of states have an Athlete Agents Act to protect student athletes from unscrupulous agents. And the requirements imposed upon agents who try to recruit and work with collegiate students is you, you can't do any of these activities, solicit or, you know, or enter into a commercial or contractual relationship with a student athlete unless and until you've registered with the state and your contracts with, with the student athlete have to contain certain disclosures. She never registered in North Carolina. The agreement contains none of the disclosures mandated by North Carolina law. And it turns out that she was in communication with Williamson's family going back months before he had ever entered into an agreement with her. So Williamson has invoked the North Carolina Athlete Agents Act to invalidate his contract 
with Gina Ford and her company, Prime Sports. Now, a violation of the Athlete Agents Act in North Carolina results in a complete invalidation of the contract. She, in turn, has responded to that lawsuit by claiming Williamson is not entitled to claim the status of a student athlete, not now, not even at the beginning of his freshman year at Duke because he was paid money to attend there. And as a result, he was in, he was acting in violation of NCAA, NCAA rules and bylaws and should never have been eligible. And because of the allegations that he received money, he can't claim the status of a student athlete under that North Carolina law. So that's one lawsuit. Second lawsuit is because she faces an all but certain defeat in a North Carolina federal court, Gina Ford wanted to also shift the forum of their legal battle and, and she brought a parallel state court action in Miami, Florida, essentially claiming that Williamson breached his contract and that CAA tortiously interfered with her contract with Williamson, as well as tortiously, tortiously interfering with their prospective economic advantage. So long story short, there were two lawsuits pending, and it turns out that there's now a third person. That's why it's very difficult to ask me these questions. <laughs> You're really asking me to give like a, a lecture on the whole litigation. But I'll tell so, you what happened. Uh, okay, well, can, I, uh, I will uh, say that was... I will say that was very impressive to explain two years of litigation while on the clock. I think you got that done in about like four minutes. That, that oh, was a, almost a master answered, class in Zion Williamson. But I never answered his question. I his was question about to was obje object on non-responsive yeah. grounds, but keep going. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Well, in order to discuss the judge's possible conflict of interest, you need to know that there's a third party involved. There was a New Orleans man uh, by the name of Cedric Hughes Johnson who knew Zion Williamson in New Orleans, played AAU basketball with him, and he allegedly introduced Gina Ford to Zion Williamson's family, not out of the goodness of his heart or because he's a nice guy, but he was promised a 5% cut of all of her income generated from representing Zion Williamson. So he sets up the introduction, and she signs Williamson, and then she reneges on her agreement, her oral agreement with Cedric Hughes Johnson. And he, in turn, sues her in, in Miami-Dade County State Court. He's represented, Cedric Hughes Johnson was represented by the judge, the judge who's overseeing the other Miami case, the main case. Cedric Johnson is represented by the law firm where the judge's son is an equity partner, Morgan and Morgan. Now, normally that wouldn't be a big deal because Johnson is suing Ford in a separate lawsuit, which, by the way, settled. But they filed a law firm, Morgan & Morgan, filed a notice of interested party in the main Florida lawsuit between Williamson and Ford. And long story short, Judge Miller, his name's David Miller, Judge David Miller's son stands to benefit indirectly if the judge rules in favor of Gene Ford, because if Ford is awarded any money, whether by settlement or judgment, Cedric Johnson gets 5% of that. And Johnson's lawyer, Morgan & Morgan, which has the judge's son as an equity partner, stands to receive a, a, a contingent fee based upon the amount of that judgment or settlement. So basically, if the judge rules in favor of Gina Ford, his son benefits. Is that a recusal? Well, we don't know at this point how Johnson is paying Morgan and Morgan. I doubt it's on an hourly billing arrangement. It's probably a contingent fee, which makes this look much, much worse and would, would lean towards recusal. And uh, Williamson's attorneys and CAA have requested discovery from Morgan and Morgan and, and, and Cedric Hughes Johnson, and they've been stonewalling Zion and CAA, which has led to a motion to compel. I'm impressed. I have no idea you did that. My question is for the crowd. By show of quick hands, do we have any 1Ls that are in here? I feel like we have a handful of, of 1Ls that are potentially in here. What, what I will say is that Dan just basically gave a masterclass between contract law, constitutional law, maybe, with some Simpro stuff in there as well, and also professional responsibility. There's a lot of different stuff that someone had to unpack there. So if you end up taking the bar exam anytime soon, Dan, Dan just gave you a, a, enough to be dangerous in a number of fields. What I do want to point out in terms of just the legal creativity, you know, creative arguments, you know, obviously uh, on a Duke level, if anyone's a college basketball fan, you know, Duke could still get hit with sanctions for this. I don't, I don't think we're out of the water on, on that front. If you just kind of at an initial level, right, if you didn't understand all the legalese at a very granular level, 
Zion Williams is not supposed to be signing deals with marketing agents while he's in school. So the extent that Duke knew about that or potentially probably should have known about it, there is potential sanction. So Taryn, I know you are a Duke fan. So just, uh, just a heads up. Don't, don't uh, think you're out of the water yet. As far as Duke goes, I think I'd be a little bit more worried if it wasn't like the Ben Hill of trial teams on the other side where they're serving deposition notices to, to dentists in Indiana. It's, it's a mess. I mean, also their argument doesn't really make sense. They're basically alleging, and this is the kind of juicy part if we ever get to depositions, but they're alleging that Zion was paid money to attend Duke. And because he was paid money prior to going to Duke, um, that that therefore doesn't allow him to void this kind of marketing contract he signed. So people should just stay in touch. You know, if the case doesn't get dismissed, which is on the table right now, we're going to have a scenario where Potentially, Mike Krzyzewski gets on a deposition stand and is being asked about what he knew about potential payments. You know, my firm is so cheap, I've yet to see a deposition stand. Uh, hopefully, Garagos and Garagos furnishes uh, those deposition stands. <laughs> but I think, you know, the proof's in the pudding here, and I judge what happens by actions rather than words. Gina Ford's lawyers have been litigating this case for a year and a half. They've yet to take a single deposition in the federal case. There's not even been a scheduling order or a meet and confer. If they truly, truly wanted to bring this to a judgment and win the case, uh, they would be going full guns a blazing. They'd be subpoenaing the NCAA, not through a doctor's office, a dentist's office, but be that as it may, that, that, was, that, that act was done months ago and it went to the wrong person. So far, we have not seen a corrected subpoena issued to the NCAA. Uh, you know, Willie Gary and the firm representing Gina Ford have really made a big disaster out of pretrial litigation. They, they basically bought an index number, probably working on a contingency, and have done no legwork to advance the case. I think they just want to be uh, left standing after a motion for judgment on the pleadings, and hopefully they can leverage a settlement, but it's not looking good in the North Carolina case. I think the law definitely is on the side of Williamson based upon the limited facts that, 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 have, that have surfaced so far, but they're just doing a, an, an inco- they've been incompetent in how one would litigate a case of this magnitude. I mean, that, that Krzyzewski, Duke, and, and the NCAA haven't even been on the radar uh, in terms of discovery notices and, and subpoenas. Uh, basically tells you that this is a fishing expedition and they've got nothing to go on except rumor, innuendo, and they don't have any evidence other than a this debunked affidavit that was filed months ago from a, uh, from a con artist. So, uh, you know, the, the case fascinates me because it crosses over so many areas of law, you know, legal ethics, contract law, uh, you know, federal practice, amateurism. I mean, it is a wonderful class to utilize as a teaching vehicle, or at least as a, as a way to explore all these different topics within the sports industry, uh, because it's one of the few cases that has a, a little bit of everything, and even forum shopping, venue shopping, forum selection. So uh, I hope the case lasts for a long time, but I'm not optimistic that it will. I think it's going to come to a screeching halt once Judge Biggs in North Carolina enters judgment on the pleadings for Zion Williamson. And, and, and when she does that, all of the other claims will collapse like a house of cards. So we're already on the, the NCAA. This week is Axe Week. The Gophers are going to hopefully take the Axe back from Wisconsin after last year's drubbing. So you guys have been heavily involved in the whole Big Ten controversy dating back to the cancellation of the season and then its, uh, its return there's been a lot of news this week. So do you guys want to comment on where we are? We are virtually in, in Minneapolis where you guys are, for better or worse, at the heart of the Big Ten conversation today. So I don't think I'm breaking any news to you guys as Minnesota fans, but Minnesota is not supposed to practice today because of a, an ongoing COVID issue. So, um, you know, I, I made the comment uh, last week or not last week, actually, you guys played on Friday. But I, I, I'm still in, in Dan... Uh, you know, we've, during the whole Big Ten saga in September, you know, we just asked a lot of questions. Like, I don't, I don't really understand, and then whoever's, you know, I, I don't know how many times I have to say it. I still don't understand how you can have an 11 to 3 vote under penalty of perjury, but like three people leave the room and they're not sure if a vote occurred or they said a vote didn't occur. Like, 
it's the like eighth wonder of the world at this point. I am not sure how that no one has figured this out. But you know, that being said, the Big Ten was able to come back. They came and they said a, they had a particular protocol. I think the threshold, I think it's 20%. I'm not going to remember offhand, but um, you know, there, there's a world right now where schools are allowed to, on their own, cancel games. So we saw that, not necessarily in the Big Ten, but we saw that with Florida State. They didn't want to play Clemson, which, you know, and they're going to reschedule the game. That's fine. The problem for the Big Ten purposes, if that happens in the Big Ten, there's a cancellation. For whatever reason, I'm not really sure of the wisdom, but they said that you cannot reschedule games in the Big Ten. So now uh, that brings us to uh, this week. So you guys uh, valiantly won. Taryn, 34-31, am I getting that right? Yeah, um, zero controversy at all. Zero controversy, no questionable pass interference calls, nothing like that. Um, but you guys played. So that, uh, you know, I don't think anyone necessarily would have faulted Minnesota for, for playing. I heard there was 20 players out, some mix of COVID uh, and injuries, but kind of some cloudiness around how many positive tests. Meanwhile, over in Columbus, Ohio, your guys' neighbor, Maryland canceled against Ohio State with eight positive tests. So seems to be just something weird how one school can cancel with eight. And then you guys, I'm not sure what the, I don't think they reported what the exact number is, but more than five and somewhere less than 20 of COVID tests. And you guys played. So now you guys are not playing. Uh, today is Tuesday, not, not, not practicing today. And if you guys do not play on Saturday, at least whoever's following this really closely, you guys are playing Wisconsin. Wisconsin had their own outbreak, missed the games against a number of teams. Wisconsin will no longer be eligible for the, uh, the Big Ten Conference title because they will have not have six games, which is the minimum for Big Ten rules. So let's just say the fate of Wisconsin's season is very much in Minnesota's hands right now. Um, I, think that, I think that means that you're battling for the axe. I feel like that's it's like the quasi-battle for the axe. So, Dan, I, I'll pitch it to you with this. I know, I mean, I think people know where I stand, but what do you think about the Big Ten potentially amending their rules given the ongoing COVID situation? I think as we've uh, gone on this tour, I think our positions as to the necessity of playing collegiate football couldn't be any more disparate than, than, than what we have. I think this is the height of absurdity uh, when you have you know, students who aren't, student athletes, they're not paid, they don't have adequate insurance, and they're clustered on, on college campuses in ways that professional athletes are not. I mean, some, you know, professional athletes are a little bit more sheltered and have more precautions, or at least they're less at risk than collegiate players. I don't understand why these games are so important that, you know, they're, you know players are dropping like flies in terms of these positive, you know, tests. And, you know, yesterday, you know, one of the players in the NFL, you know, developed a, you know, I forget the name of that uh, diagnosis, but he's now, there, there's some cardio issues related to it. And I think we haven't had the full accounting of the consequences associated with playing college football during this fall. And it's, it's incredible that uh, for the public to insist that, that collegiate players who aren't paid, who don't have insurance, 98% of whom will never play in the National Football League, that they're basically our, our, our guinea pigs, uh, you know, to, to sort of, you know, contribute to our enjoyment and keep our minds off of, 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 other, of other things, that we need this. And I think, there's a, I think there's a line of demarcation between professional athletes and amateur athletes. And if you're not, and I know a lot of the schools are having in-person classes, but most or many are, are teaching virtually. And you can't think of a higher risk situation than having other players, clusters of players breathing on you in close quarters like this during athletic competition with, you know, body to body contact. I, if I was a college president in the Big Ten, my vote would have been to suspend the season or to consider playing in the spring. That would have been the only logical outcome. So this given, whole thing of, given where we are, and I, again, I mean, we, we're kind of just in it now. I mean, the question really, if if you have a five games, you know, you only have five games, you need six. If you have a team, it's not like a Florida State situation or, or sorry, a Clemson situation where a player potentially tested positive and you kind of had suspicions, you were trying to isolate him. Um, you know, there potentially is a COVID situation in your team. I'm not talking about playing a game when you have five or six positive tests, but there's a world where everyone's tested negative uh, and you have a completely healthy team versus another healthy team. But that other healthy team happens to be out of the conference. So when I'm talking about amending the rules, I don't really see the harm if you have a fully healthy team, be it like a Chattanooga that Nebraska, shout out to Nebraska, uh, tried to play 
Like, I don't really see the harm if Wisconsin wants to play some random non-conference opponent to get their schedule. But, Dan, you did mention um, a buzzword. Taryn uh, actually had that on our list of topics, the NFL player that got myocarditis. So let me let me pitch to Taryn. Let's move on to our, our third topic. Taryn, take it away. I just wanted to say also, I think uh, Dan Wallach's colleague at The Athletic, Nicole Auerbach, did report a couple weeks ago or last week that the Big Ten had made a decision to allow teams to solicit out-of-conference uh, opponents now. So I'm not sure if that'll happen. But allow versus, like, will, because the Big Ten doesn't do anything that makes sense. So <laughs> I, I am not confident that they'll actually do that. Dan did mention the NFL player who it was announced yesterday for, for Dan Lust Buffalo Bills that Tommy Sweeney is going to miss the rest of the season with myocarditis. Is there any exposure for the NFL whether it be the league or the franchises for a player who develops a heart issue that could be possibly tied to coronavirus and maybe a reflection of those protocols that are in place? I mean, I I think that the troubling part, and Dan, I know, um, I mean, we we can see eye to eye in this. I mean, in terms of causation is always going to be tough. And I think, Taryn, that's that's the, the bigger part from a legal level. People are worried about COVID lawsuits, which they're very well maybe, but anyone, I think, Torts is still a required 1L class, right guys? Right, I'm not, I'm not too old? Okay, I didn't graduate so long ago. Duty breach, causation, harm. You know, you have a duty to protect your players. The breach of that duty can come in any number of ways in terms of uh, uns- you know, being unsafe. Skipping, obviously, the third element, causation, but damages, right? Myocarditis is, the, is pretty scary, right? Like we saw that with baseball, Eduardo Rodriguez. Like we got through the baseball season, but like, I don't know if Eduardo Rodriguez, you know, he's a... Not, not like some, you know, all-star Hall of Famer on the Red Sox, but a solid guy. He's, you know, been a spot starter in my fantasy team for a number of years. Like, he's a really big talent. Missed the entire season with myocarditis. So, you know, had it happened to, you know, a bigger player, I think there'd be more notice about it. But, like, it's just really a matter of time. So the damages are there. But, Taryn, you asked me, like, right, and that's that's really, like, kind of the call to question. Like, what are the possible ramifications for the NFL? I mean... NFL could get sued, right? Like this isn't a this isn't like an assumption of the risk, implied assumption of the risk injury. Like we don't really, no one really subscribes to getting infected with COVID. But like, in a sense, kind of it, you know, you assume the risk of playing. You play during this pandemic, as we've all known. This this is potential injury myocarditis. It's not the first time you've heard of it. But like, you know, there's still proximate cause. If you're not in an NBA bubble, right? Like you're doing any number of things and touching any number of people, any number of factors going to, you know, even like the CVS, right? Without gloves or whatever, walking around like a, in a full hazmat suit. If I'm the attorney on the NFL side, I'm going to really short of like a surveillance camera of everything you're doing in your life. Like, how are you going to, like, there's no way for you to affirmatively show the proximate cause. So I think, you know, it's not a good look to get sued because of a myocarditis issue or, or a COVID issue, but like on a nuts and bolts level, if this ever hit a courtroom, if I'm the defense attorney, which, you know, I've spent most of my career practicing on the defense end, it's going to be really, really hard to prove optics and PR notwithstanding. Like, I don't think you're going to get any type of verdict anytime soon. Dan, what do you think? Well, I think, uh, you know, was, you know, to, to the extent which claims might have been waived under a modified CBA, I think if you, even if you get past that, the apps, as you correctly pointed out, Dan, the absence of a bubble environment, you know, a la the NBA and NHL really does create proximate cause uh, issues because the player only spends so many hours per day, you know, around his team and in practice and spends other time at home, around family, around friends, finding the link uh, or the causal relationship may be a challenge. And then, you know, now there's the issue of, is it even COVID related? I mean, on, on my timeline yesterday on Twitter, and I mean, almost mirroring the political debate in our country, there are people who I would call COVID deniers or minimizers. And on my timeline, when I retweeted the article about, about Tommy Sweeney, um, two folks, two, 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 two of my followers wrote, myocarditis is caused by a myriad of different infections, even the common cold. So again- one of, your, one of two followers, Dabo Sweeney? <laughs> no, but you get, you get into this, we can't even agree on the facts. And, and uh, with, with the misinformation, at least, the messaging around COVID-19 on, on, on either side, I think it really does become uh, a, a, a proof issue as well as a, a possible you know, jury nullification issue if it ever came down to that. Uh, so in all likelihood, this is covered under the CBA because not every player 
who developed symptoms from COVID, you know, from COVID-19 can sue the National Football League. I think that would be adequately covered under their, their modified CBA, but I'm, I'm not overly familiar with the precise language and there are always exceptions and ways to circumvent, uh, you know, you know, basic uh, carve outs and prohibitions. And I don't know if that applies here. And just to be clear, Tommy Sweeney did miss a few weeks. Uh, he was on that COVID-19 reserve list. So uh, while it is possible that any number of infections could cause myocarditis, I'm not a doctor, but but that's what I've read. It, it, it's, you know, the connection is there. Okay, so we are currently talking about standing to sue. Our Sports Law Association President Colton Messer is a former employee of the Houston Astros, but not when they were banging on trash cans, but instead losing more than 100 games a year. So do fans who may or may not have put uh, money on the line betting for or against the Astros, do they have any standing to sue? And then also Jeff Lunau uh, a couple weeks ago announced that he was pursuing uh, some, some litigation against the Astros for making him the fall guy. What kind of standing does he have, and and how is that? How do you see that shaking out? Dan, you handle the Lunau. I'll handle the fan standing. I mean, it, it's been established over a long line of federal court decisions that fans don't have standing to sue. Buying a ticket doesn't give one the right to uh, initiate litigation out of any out for anything that happens within the lines. Uh, that principle has been extended in the case of of betters, people who've placed wagers. And, and we have Bill Belichick to thank for that. I think there's a well-known uh, case in the District of New Jersey where uh, a man by the name of Carl Mayer, uh, I think, brought a lawsuit against Bill Belichick roughly 20 years ago. And out of that decision, the principle of, of rejecting fan standing absent something significantly more than just buying a ticket. I think that's been well established in all of these lawsuits. That lawsuit, I don't want you to gloss over it. It's a, it's a huge... I mean, it's pretty close to the Astro situation, as close as you're going to get. The, the basically a fan sued the sued Bill Belichick out of Spygate, out of using a camera to spy on the Jets' signs on the sidelines. So, like, obviously, in the history of baseball, we don't really have a lawsuit like this. But like, I don't know. The Jets the Jets accused the Patriots of basically a video of an employee going to Jets practices and using a camera to spy on what their signs were before the game. So. Spygate is like pretty close to the sign stealing saga. So like for anyone, it's not like binding authority, but like it's pretty close to persuasive authority, right? Like it's it's pretty close. I mean, it's a, it's almost like taxpayer standing to challenge legislation. Just having a sort of an indirect financial or or tie to the actual controversy isn't going to be enough to develop Article Three standing in federal court. And by the way, that wasn't any ordinary fan who sued. He was my law professor, uh, Carl Mayer. Was a, a, he taught corporations law and business law at Hofstra Law School in the late 1980s, early 1990s, and I was in his first ever class. I'm, I'm like Z the zealot of sports law. I really am. But to his credit, years later, he sh showed his credibility by waiting on a, a line to buy tickets to see Bruce Springsteen. I, I reconnected with him. That, that ten years later, wait, that doesn't make up for the fact that he lost in court that he liked. <laughs> Yeah, and he was all. And, and by the way, just a, a, another uh, six degrees of separation. Carl Mayer was represented in that lawsuit by my editor of, of the high school. The, the, I was a sports editor of the high school newspaper called the Jet Gazette. The editor in chief, Bruce Afrin, I believe it was Bruce Afrin, represented Carl Mayer in that case. So also, that doesn't make up for the fact that he lost. <laughs> like, I see what you're trying to do here by trying to hide me from the facts, but I'm paying attention. Your professor. Yeah, so, you know, yeah, so you can't, you, you know, if you buy a ticket, there, there's, there's no, buy a ticket or even bet on the game. The case law is overwhelmingly against the um, concept of better or fan standing. It's been rejected in every case that I know of, uh, other than if you're, I guess, if you're hit by a ball in the field of play and there's negligence and even in that area, uh, the law is evolving, but it is not evolving as a general proposition with regard to paying for a ticket, giving you a right to sue over anything that occurs within the lines of the game. And can I just say that that also just further confirms that you have to like Bruce Springsteen in order to write for a sports website? 
It doesn't confirm that by any means. <laughs> What are, you, what are you guys like teaming up here? These none of these facts have anything to do with Dan's professor losing in court. I'm the, just saying that, that if you polled sports writers, a vast majority would love Bruce Springsteen. So pivoting to something else that's gotten a lot of airtime, Brent, the uh, the sign stealing scandal. Jeff Lunau, he basically takes the fall for this. I, AJ Hinch loses his job as well, but he's back managing now. Alex Cora loses his job; he's back managing now. Not sure if Lunau's really going to get another opportunity, and he said that he wants to pursue a suit. So how do you see that going, Dan Moss? So he went from threat, um, and I uh, will see uh, if anybody is familiar with this podcast. There's a great one called The Edge. It's about the, uh, the Astro Saga cult, and I feel like that is required listening for you as a former member of the team. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I listened to Lunau on this podcast maybe two weeks ago, and then all of a sudden, like, he files this lawsuit suing the team. So he went from threat to actually doing it. Really like the last semblance of like punished guys are really Lunau and Carlos Beltran. Both are still on the sidelines. Beltran lost his job with the Mets. So Lunau is basically alleging that, it's an interesting argument. Uh, we'll see how, how much he flushes it out in court, but that essentially in order to, to be divested of his guaranteed money, I believe it's 20 million, if I'm remembering, it's right in that vicinity. But he, he believed he was uh, guaranteed the rest of his contract. So, you know, in terms of employment law, you know, if you are fired for cause, you do something that's unethical or stealing from the company or, you know, uh, you go up to your boss, like what allegedly happened at New York Giants practice and you punch your boss in the face. Like, that's probably grounds to be divested of the rest of your guaranteed money. So what Luna is alleging is that what he did or what he's alleged to have done in, in the sign stealing scandal doesn't amount to cause and he should have been given the rest of his 20 million, whatever it is. So, you know, on a, on a just a practical level, there was right. The whole thing about sign stealing is that this wasn't per se illegal, that it was unwritten code. So I understand Lunau's argument from that perspective, because he's saying, what did I do that was wrong? Like you, you can push the envelope to a certain extent to give yourself an advantage. And to his credit, like I think Manfred and everyone has kind of said what they what they were doing wasn't necessarily illegal to a certain point. And even Luna was saying, or even Manfred is saying, Luna wasn't involved. It was really a, a player's scheme, but that Luna should have been aware of it. And that Jim Crane probably at the ownership level should have been aware of it. But like, I don't know. I don't know if that necessarily counts as cause for being fired. Maybe it's, you know, a discretionary reason and you fire someone to put, make someone the example. But that's kind of what Luna was arguing, that he was improperly made the scapegoat of this whole scheme. And he was really the only one, at least from the Astros organization, that's not being given a second chance, right? Karen, as you mentioned, Alex Cora is back with the Red Sox and Hinch is back with the Tigers. Beltran, when he got, when he lost his job, he had been with the Mets, but I don't know. So I, I see it. Uh, and I know, you know, I've, I've spoke about this elsewhere, but I think this is a lawsuit that you want to settle quickly because you don't want Luno out there. Listen, people are going to believe what Luno says. And if Luno goes out and he says, yeah, you remember that clip that everyone's talking about with Jose Altuve when he didn't want to get his shirt taken off? Well, I know he had a buzzer underneath him because that's a guy that has credibility all of a sudden. And that's a guy that's now averse to the Astros. So you as a, an attorney, like I'm a defense attorney, if I'm defending the Astros, I, I tell them, listen, it could be $20 million. Your organization is worth literally billions of dollars. And if that comes out, right, if you have Jeff Lunau of all people saying, right, like, yeah, that's, that's why Carlos Correa hasn't been the same guy because he was always getting signed somehow. Or, you know, that's why for Altuve had an off year this year because he got every single pitch given to him ahead of time. If Luna says those kind of comments, that's going to kill the organization. So I, I, my gut and what I would be doing is handing them 20, handing Luna was 20 million, which I 50, 50 is entitled to, but that NDA, that non-disclosure agreement is really priceless. It's more, worth much more than $20 million. And that's why you'd settle that lawsuit, uh, I would think, tomorrow if you could. Yeah, well, I think Lunau has made a, a sort of a tactical decision, or at least in a, he's made a, a self-assessment that he's never going to work in Major League Baseball as a general manager again. And if you really 
are pursuing opportunities or have pursued opportunities and you're still interested, you don't bring a lawsuit like this. This is like the you know, nuclear bomb for your, for, your, for your career in Major League Baseball. So, uh, you know, by bringing a lawsuit like this, I guess he raises his visibility. Besides getting the, the prospect of a significant monetary settlement, this raises his visibility, makes him potentially appealing as, a, as, a, as an on-air personality, a podcaster, a broadcaster, but he would not have gone to this level of actually filing litigation if he thought there was even a 2% chance that he was going to be in the running for any of the general manager jobs around baseball. His career is cooked and he obviously is a cornered individual now with nothing to lose and he knows quite a bit. So this is a, uh, this is a dangerous game for Major League Baseball and for the Astros to continue playing. There's very little upside to beating him. And the downside is just, it could, it could be extraordinarily damaging to the goodwill of baseball and to the Astros. So uh, I, I see this ultimately uh, settling fairly quickly uh, without there being any fact discovery. Because the moment it goes into discovery, you won't be able to put the genie back in the bottle. It becomes a public record eventually. Did you just, did you just quote Christina Aguilera? Is that what yeah. I just heard? Yeah, like Springsteen to Aguilera, absolutely. My versatility knows no limits. I'm, I'm very impressed. I'm not even mad. I mean, it could have been a whole block of cheese, but I'm... I'm yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, in, in another five minutes, uh, I'm going to be, uh, you know, quoting, you know, South Korean, you know, boy bands. So, you know, just watch out. What do they call that? That's... <laughs> ETS. They were on the yeah. yeah. You're not going to lie to anyone and pretend you don't know who BTS is, okay? That's just, that's just not happening on my watch. <laughs> <laughs> so let's uh, pivot quickly to another case that you guys have been hot on the heels of. Dan Wallach, you're a huge Giants fan. DeAndre Baker, there was the, the cookout armed robbery, allegedly, this uh, past offseason. And, uh, and now the charges as of last week have been dropped. Is this case dead completely because of the uh, interference between the alleged witnesses taking money? Is DeAndre Baker free and clear now? His criminal case has been dropped. He was under indictment by the Broward County State Attorney's Office. And given the credibility issues associated with these witnesses and you know, seeking to get paid, you know, they're, they're seeking compensation to change their testimony, they are not witnesses that are believable under oath. So the case got dropped. It doesn't necessarily mean that he's in the clear within the National Football League because there may be enough uh, evidence in the form of witness affidavits and law enforcement uh, investigative materials that could give Roger Goodell and the NFL enough to discipline Baker because the standard of evidence for violating the personal conduct policy under Article 46 of the CBA, or it's incorporated within Article 46 of the CBA, is the credible evidence standard. So uh, guilt or innocence aside, uh, the threshold for being disciplined in the NFL is so low that if the if, if if Commissioner Goodell or the arbitrator who's assigned to a hypothetical case wants to find Baker in violation of the of the conduct policy, there probably is sufficient credible evidence to make that determination. And 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 I certainly want to emphasize that the witnesses' uh, sale of their testimony or recanted testimony doesn't necessarily uh, uh, preclude the possibility that they were telling the truth in the first instance. And all this actually went down as they described and we're now trying to leverage their testimony to at least change their testimony for a price. So I, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm being as being the cynic that I am, I would not be surprised if something went down that evening the way it was described in the probable cause affidavit, but the witnesses are just not good witnesses to present before a jury. And as a result, the state attorney's office exercised its discretion uh, to not move forward with the case because if all you have is recanted testimony uh, or you know, your recanted testimony isn't enough uh, to satisfy the proof beyond a reasonable doubt standard, at least under Florida law. So the, the prosecutors were left with an unwinnable case. And that doesn't necessarily mean that he's out of, you know, he's out of danger when it comes to the when it, when it comes to NFL discipline. I think there's still a possibility that he faces some discipline uh, for his actions, or at least at a minimum, an investigation. 
So the, the only thing I, I want to kind of add is just where we go from here. I mean, Dan, you, you pointed it out. Like, DeAndre Baker is a first-round talent from the Giants. We, we mentioned on the previous podcast. But the Giants basically let Baker go. And you can talk about innocent to completely guilty all you want. In the NFL, obviously, there's a lesser burden to, to get hit with the suspension. And there's also just the optics of having a guy who is alleged to have committed armed robbery on your roster. So all of a sudden, uh, the story went from the Giants looking bad to maybe even looking worse um, because they cut bait with him. And uh, not just worse in maybe the court of public opinion, but maybe in the fraternity that is the NFL because where does DeAndre Baker go? He gets to call his shot and he signs with the Kansas City Chiefs. So I personally don't think a suspension is going to be coming. If you want to play on the other side of it, you know, Taryn, you, you called it a cookout. I might call it a COVID cookout because this barbecue slept armed robbery with this party of people occurred in the midst of COVID, mind you. I think even just from something as silly as a pure and, uh, I don't know, uh, un, un indefensible violation of, of COVID protocol, I mean, even that could amount to something that's uh, suspension worthy, especially at a party where there's gambling and there were drugs um, uh, and guns. So, I mean, let's, let's not rule that out, even if he wasn't uh, necessarily the ringleader of the assault and, or the armed robbery. And I think to Dan Wallach's point, like Dan is, is hitting on something really important. For all we know, right, DeAndre Baker, the charges against him were he was, he was the lead, uh, the ringleader of this armed robbery. He was directing people with guns that do this, take the money from that person. Um, the only thing that's happened is that we don't believe the witnesses anymore because they flip flopped back and forth because they were, you know, at least as, as has been alleged, the attorney was trying to, uh, we'll say, do some uh, brokering of a deal uh, to have the witnesses change their story. It doesn't mean that, that there was no truth to this, um, because let's not forget, like, the prosecutor's office did bring charges, right? They independently thought there was something here, but that these witnesses uh, don't feel, um, you know, that they can go in front of a jury anymore. At least the prosecutor doesn't have faith in their testimony. So um, yeah. there's a lot of smoke here. Yeah, I, I mean, it also, it also highlights uh, the incredibly poor decision that the Giants made, if we're going to focus on my fandom with the New York Giants, uh, their, their management of draft assets to move up in the draft to select DeAndre Baker in the first round. I believe they packaged two or three additional picks on top of their own early second round pick to move five, six or seven spots down. And this is really fallout from, you know, Gettleman's, you know, drafting history with the Giants that has come under attack in three consecutive years, typified by his selection of Andrew Thomas to anchor the offensive line when he's now of all the uh, tackles drafted in the first round, he's probably the worst performing tackle in the bunch. And the Giants may be paying the price for years of draft asset mismanagement going all the way back to Jerry Reese. And I don't think the situation has been rectified by Gettleman who may now be on the way out. And another general manager coming in, having to basically have Joe Judge foisted upon him to quote a Larry David term as his head coach. So the, the danger or downside risk of making bad first round draft choices and having the wrong people in your managerial role or in your head coaching role could end up having, you know, sort of repercussions uh, for years after the selections are made. And uh, DeAndre Baker probably stands out as the uh, dumbest decision in Dave Gettleman's tenure as a general manager, and it may very well cost him his job. Okay, well, I, I think we can open it up. If there are any lingering questions, I know Colton, you had a question if there are any questions in the audience, feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask that. Uh, otherwise, uh, I can direct us somewhere else. Sure. I had a, I had a quick one, and it's going back. Let me, let me bring it back up. We were talking about uh, proximate causation with you know, the NFL being sued. I was just thinking in more general terms, do you think courts would start limiting as a policy reason liability regarding COVID? Every 1L in Minnesota learns about the, the tort case about the New York blackout back in the 70s and how, I can't remember off the top of my head, uh, the energy company being sued, but the, the courts limited the liability because obviously 8 million people suing one company is going to overwhelm the court system. So I just wanted to see what your guys' thoughts there. That's obviously much more general than just sports, but it's something that I thought of when you guys were discussing that. Unrelated to sports, Colton, that's a great beer. Thanks. <laughs> great beer. I think at a policy level, like there was a lot of conversations. I want to say, I mean, it's like, it feels like years ago at this point, but probably April or May, we're on a federal level. They were thinking of 
uh, immunizing employers from potential COVID suits. So we're not really out of the water on that yet. Like even so we're in New York, I probably should mention, I'm, I'm in New York, Dan's in Florida, but Dan's fandom is because he grew up in New York. So yeah, I mean, even, even in New York, which maybe is treating the virus, uh, we'll say well, it was more conservative with, with respect to their approach. I don't think we've seen the wave of lawsuits that will happen yet. And I think on a, I don't know, and I, and I, don't, I don't like bringing this case up just because it brings up a lot of emotions, but it's important. Like the, the virus is still, we don't know, right? Like myocarditis is a long-term illness. So like, you know, when I worked on the defense end and litigation, like there's asbestos cases and it takes years for asbestos to manifest, manifest itself in your system. Same thing. And this is the you know the sensitive one, but like the World Trade Center attacks, like it took years for you to have to manifest that in your system. So on a federal level and then an insurance premium level, people's employers are going to have to pay a lot more money over the years because they're still going to be worried about when these lawsuits are going to come. Like some people find out about myocarditis, but like those are professional athletes that are getting tested every day. And like, I'd be lying if I said like, you know, this past week I had a cold, like it turned out like to be nothing, but like in the back of my head, I'm like, well, wouldn't it be nice to be a professional athlete right now? And I'm just getting tested every single day. And I have these like, whoop, you know, whatever these golfers have, it's like whoop bands and like they can have a disrupted sleep pattern. And all of a sudden they know they have COVID. I'm like, that would be fantastic right now. But yeah, I don't, I don't think we've seen, seen the end of it. Um, hopefully this stuff starts to get cheaper in terms of early detection that people, anybody can have it. Um, and then maybe all Colton, it's a moot point if this vaccine comes out uh, and it's as effective as people say it is. But yeah, I don't, I think it's, it's not ripe yet for a, a real challenge to federal. You know, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't think we're quite there yet, but if it just can never be a vaccine to this, I mean, by all means, like it might need to be a federal issue of just lawsuits start coming left and right. That was a great question. We have time for one more, if there's one more from the audience. Hi, does that same kind of rationale apply to schools and NCAA athletes as well? Ellie, I, I think it's a, it's a good question because Dan and I see eye to eye on a lot of things. We, we are a little bit different on our views as to whether college sports can be played right now. The call of your question is, you know, aren't some schools scared about getting hit with lawsuits? Like I did a couple of different radio hits probably around, you know, April, May, when we were all thinking about the question. It's not an insane question. Like, and I, and I don't really fault the Big Ten for their analysis. I fault the Big Ten for their lack of transparency and like Kevin Warren just like, I don't know, like being aloof and not answering any tough questions. But like on a, on a practical level, like the gamble is, do you think that your athletes are going to be okay such that you'll take the risk of getting hit with all these lawsuits, right? Like, do you think you'll make the amount of revenue you'll generate from playing Big Ten football? Is that going to far outweigh the uh, amount of lawsuits and potential exposure you have from getting hit with COVID lawsuits? And, right, like if you're betting on a vaccine coming, like maybe you're about to look really smart that you played football. Um, and, you know, everyone recovers, maybe you'll look really smart. But like, as much as, you know, everyone wants to pretend they know everything about uh, COVID, like we don't know the answers to those questions. So I've made the analogy, it's almost Ellie, like, you know, if you're playing poker and you have uh, like two clubs in your hands and there's two clubs on the flop, like you can put a bet out, like you have almost like a 50% chance of hitting your, your flush by the flop, like by the river, but like, you don't really know that. So it's, it's a tough call for schools to have to make that decision I don't necessarily think that the Big Ten playing has changed their analysis, regardless of whether, you know, this whole like we, there's a medical update. So therefore, we're going to play football. Like, I don't really buy that. I just buy that the Big Ten is playing football because they didn't want to be the only major conference that wasn't playing football. Um, the Pac-12 doesn't count because they're, you know, they don't really count. They're not really a major conference. But yeah, I, I, I think, Ellie, this is a, a tremendous concern for colleges. I still think it's a concern. And to me, uh, I think it's very concerning that like, you have Clemson, this was, this happened this past weekend. Clemson wants to play a game, even though they have a player who has shown symptoms of COVID the entire week. They had a, they knew he had symptoms because they kept him isolated on the bus, according to Davos Sweeney. And then when it comes time to play, they go, hey, by the way, Florida State, we have a player we think had COVID and he traveled with us, but like ACC says we can play. So like, let's go ahead and play. And it's, I think, problematic that Florida State is like kind of being shamed that they don't think it's safe to play under those standards when there is this massive liability, maybe even a billion dollar question that's across the country. So, um, you know, I'd, I'd hope there would be relief for schools, um, but to Dan Wallach's point, that's why there were a lot of people that said we shouldn't play college sports at all. So it's, we're, I mean, just because we're playing now doesn't mean we're completely out of the issue. So 
I don't know. You can make the argument both ways. I, I find it interesting, but uh, definitely a messy situation across college campuses. That's great. Thank you so much, Dan and Dan. Uh, so with that, we've come to the end of our time. Really appreciate you guys taking the time to come and speak. Thank you to the uh, University of Minnesota and the law school and the uh, Sports Law Association, especially all of our executive boards that were able to be here today. Dan, did you want to give any uh, wrap up comments? I'm at Sports Law Lost on Twitter and Instagram, if uh, Instagram is more your flavor. Dan has an Instagram, but he doesn't know how to access it, so he doesn't really post there. No comment? No, it's, uh, oh. it's like sending me a message on LinkedIn. That's where messages go to die. Oh, that's, that's uh, terrible. For podcast purposes, that'll put this in the books. Minnesota Law School, our third and final installment of the live episodes of Conduct Detrimental. We will see everyone next week on another episode of Conduct Detrimental.